Hey plant propagators, today we're going to be talking about tissue culture. Tissue culture is a rapidly expanding sector of propagation both in the US and worldwide. Even if you don't know what tissue culture is, or yet, chances are you've eaten part of a plant in which tissue culture has played a part. Unless, of course, that is you absolutely loathe strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, potatoes, sweet potatoes, bananas, pineapple, pistachio, walnut, almond and hazelnuts. By the end of this unit, you will know what tissue culture is and you'll be able to describe the advantages and disadvantages of tissue culture techniques. And you'll also be able to outline the main stages involved in tissue culture. Let's start by defining tissue culture. Tissue culture is a branch of plant propagation where very small pieces of plant tissue are propagated in vitro on a defined medium in aseptic conditions in a laboratory. In vitro just means in a container. The tissue is multiplied repeatedly until the desired quantity of plantlets is reached. Light and temperature in the culture room are carefully controlled and monitored. As with conventional macro propagation techniques, there's no single protocol that's used for every plant. Cultural and environmental conditions of each stage can also vary, sometimes widely, even between cultivars of the same species. Now let's look at a very, very brief history of tissue culture. As with many of the vegetative techniques of ma macro propagation that we've already looked at, the success of tissue culture techniques is based on the concept of totipotency in plant cells, which we discussed in an earlier module. Totipotency was first described in the late 1800s and the first successful propagation of plants using true tissue culture methods was carried out in the 1920s using root and shoot, shoot tip culture and also using cambium tissue from the tree sycamore maple, Asa pseudoplatinus. In the late 1950s and 60s, the orchid in industry was the first to adopt tissue culture on a widespread commercial scale because it enabled growers to eliminate problems they were having at that time with viruses. The effects of viruses include discoloration of foliage, distortion of growth, stunting of growth, and a lack of vigor. And there are no pesticides that are effective on viruses. So tissue culture techniques were really welcomed by the orchid industry. By the mid 1980s, 16% of worldwide tissue culture production was woody trees and shrubs. Tissue culture is now an increasingly important branch of plant propagation. There are many businesses that just provide tissue culture services, but many of the larger conventional nurseries and even some smaller ones, like the Tree of Life Nursery in San Juan Capistrano, which is the state's largest native plant nursery, are establishing their own in-house tissue culture labs. So let's take a look now at what's involved in tissue culture. There are five commonly recognized sequential stages in the tissue culture process. They're numbered zero through four, and we're going to take a quick look at each of these stages. In many ways, these stages are very similar to some of the steps we've already looked at for propagating plants from stem cuttings. It's just that in tissue culture, everything is just on a much smaller scale and done in a lab instead of the greenhouse. Stage zero involves stock plant management and the selection of explants. Explants are the plant material that will be used for propagation. Stock plants are usually quarantined and maintained in clean, controlled environment greenhouses. If stem tissue is going to be used, the plants may be pruned to stimulate lateral shoot growth in order to provide a good initial supply of shoots for the next stage, stage one. During stage zero, 
all the usual considerations of good nursery hygiene practices apply. The mother plants must be clean, free of pests and diseases, with no nutrient deficiencies and not water stressed in any way. They're usually tested for pathogens before any propagation material is collected, and it can take between two weeks to six months to ensure that the stock plants are clean. In stage one, there are three main steps. The first step is explant isolation or excision. This is just a fancy way of saying that propagation material is collected from the mother plant. Secondly, the plant material that's collected is surface sterilized. And then thirdly, it's established in vitro on an appropriate medium. So let's take a look at these three steps. Virtually any plant part of the plant can be used in tissue culture. We can use vegetative tissue, such as apical meristems. We can use leaves, stems, roots. We can also use reproductive parts, such as anthers, pollen, ovules, embryo, seed, and spores. For the most part in this unit, the material that I'm going to present is based on stem tissue, so vegetative tissue. We're not gonna go into any detail on how tissue culture techniques are used for reproductive plant parts. Before the plant material can be cultured in vitro, it has to be as clean as possible. Eggs plants are surface sterilized, usually by treating them with a series of disinfectant solutions and rinses for specific lengths of time. 70% isopropyl alcohol and sodium hypochlorite or bleach solutions are the usual surface disinfectants used and distilled water is used for the rinses. The process is often finished by soaking the explants in an antioxidant which reduces browning of the plant tissue that's caused by phenolics during the disinfection process. On the right is a diagram we used in our class tissue culture lab a couple of years ago which gives you a good idea of just how thorough the steriliza sterilization process is in tissue culture. Tissue culture is expensive and there are usually hundreds of thousands of plants in the culture room. So the introduction of bacterial or fungal pathogens could be absolutely devastating. That's why hygiene is of the utmost importance in tissue culture. After being surface sterilized, the plant parts are placed in test tubes or jars on a culture medium that's appropriate for that particular species or cultivar. There's no universal culture medium that works for all plants, but modifications of the Murashigi and Skoog or MS basal medium are used most often. And I'll describe that a little more in a couple of minutes. The containers with the explants are then placed in the culture room where the environmental conditions are precisely controlled. In the photo, you can see a small stem cutting of lilac that has just been stuck for initiation at microplant nurseries in Gervais, Oregon. You can see that the procedure here looks very, very similar to conventional stem cuttings, except on a much smaller scale. This cutting in the test tube is probably barely an inch long which is actually quite big compared to a lot of the material that's worked with in tissue culture. All work with plant material is done at workstations with laminar airflow hoods, which you'll see in the next slide. There are very specific plant and equipment handling techniques, all designed to reduce the risk of contamination. In the photo here, you can see one of our students a couple of years ago transplanting miniature rose cuttings onto a rooting medium. In order to reduce the risk of contamination, he's got the test tube angled away from him, and ideally, the test tube should also be angled slightly downwards to reduce the risk of bacterial and fungal spores entering the test tube. The planting and division of plant material is done in a transfer room. In the photo, you can see a small section of the transfer room at microplant nurseries in Oregon. All the work is done at laminar airflow workstations, 
and workers wear surgical masks to reduce the risk of contaminating the plant material. This has nothing to do with COVID. The temperature in the transfer room is usually kept fairly cool. And if you look closely, you can see that the technician on the right has a blanket over her legs because the lab is so cool. In many labs, the technicians also wear lab coats and head coverings. The plant material to be worked on is brought in on carts and containers, containers with medium in them are also brought in on a cart from a separate media preparation area. Once plant material has been placed on a culture medium, it's transferred from the transfer room to the culture room, where the environmental conditions are carefully controlled. Lighting's provided by fluorescent, or more usually now, LED lights, and the photo period is closely controlled. For example, at Driscoll's in their Watsonville lab, berries are given a 16-8 photo period, which means 16 hours of light and eight hours of dark. And Driscoll's maintains their culture room at a constant 72 to 74 degrees Fahrenheit, both day and night. A reliable ventilation and temperature control system is needed so that the culture room doesn't become too hot. And a reliable backup generator is absolutely essential in case of power outages. An alarm system for power outages, temperature and light fluctuations is also recommended. Sanitation in the culture room has to be impeccable. Cultures must be closely monitored and any diseased material removed immediately. Meticulous record keeping at every stage of the process enables traceback procedures to identify the source of any contamination that enters the culture room or the transfer lab. Before moving on to describing stage two, let's talk about the media that are used in tissue culture. The medium supplies nutrients and water to the plant tissue whilst it's in culture just as soil does for field grown crops. However, the big difference between tissue culture and field grown crops is that the medium in tissue culture also provides sugars as a substitute for photosynthesis because plants in tissue culture aren't capable of doing their own photosynthesis. The media also contains plant growth regulators to control the type of growth that's needed. Cytokinins are added to promote shoot growth and auxins are added to promote root growth. These ingredients are all added to a gel-like agar or agar base that's thick enough to hold plant material in place, but por porous enough to allow gaseous exchange. The medium, along with appropriate temperatures and photo periods in the culture room, provide ideal conditions for the stage of growth that the explants are at. For herbaceous material, modifications of the Murashige and Skoog or MS basal medium are most frequently used. This medium is named after two plant scientists, Murashige and Skoog, who were two of the first people to describe a recipe that would be used frequently for plants in tissue culture. The medium contains mineral salts, sucrose, vitamins and cytokinins and auxins. Media can be purchased ready-made, which is useful for smaller operations as you don't need the facilities to store all the ingredients or the space to prepare the media. Larger operations usually prefer to purchase individual ingredients for the media and then prepare the media themselves as needed. Stage two involves the rapid exponential multiplication of plant tissue. The cultures produced in stage one are brought out of the culture room after about two to four weeks, perhaps more, depending on the species. By this time, they should have grown. And in the case of stem tissue, will have produced small lateral shoots. The plant material is removed from its containers, cut into smaller pieces, which are then replanted on a similar medium in new sterile containers and put back into the culture room 
for each of these pieces to put on more growth. In stage two, there may be a higher ratio of cytokinins to auxins in order to promote shoot production. Production of roots isn't needed at this stage. When the plant material has produced sufficient shoots, again, perhaps in around four weeks, it's removed from the culture room and the process I described in the previous slide is repeated for however many times are needed to reach the desired quantity of young, unrooted plants. Factors affecting the rate of shoot multiplication are the physiological status of the plant material, the ingredients in the culture medium, and light and temperature in the culture environment. One of the main advantages of tissue culture over conventional macro propagation techniques is that the production of new plants can be extremely rapid. For example, let's look at the diagram here on the right. Let's take just one explant that we start off with. So this little plant right there and we're going to assume a four week subculture period. This explant here is established in culture in stage one. After four weeks, it's brought out of the culture room and it's produced, let's assume, two lateral shoots. So that's represented right there. These lateral shoots plus the stem can be cut and then replanted and returned to the culture room. They're going to be back in the culture room for four weeks. After four weeks they come out and each of these three stems that went in four weeks ago has now produced two more shoots of their own. These plantlets can be divided in the same way as we did four weeks ago. The parts are replanted and returned to the culture room. So you get the idea. This process is repeated for as long as necessary. And you can see that in the diagram here, I've continued the figures up till 24 weeks. By the end of 24 weeks, we have 243 plantlets from just that one single stem, assuming we haven't had any losses in the process. If we graph the number of plantlets produced, you can see the exponential increase in the number of plantlets that we obtain using tissue culture techniques. This rapid multiplication just wouldn't be possible if we were, if we were using conventional stem cutting techniques. So this aspect of tissue culture is extremely useful for plant breeders when they've selected a new cultivar and need to inc increase its numbers really quickly in order to introduce that new cultivar to the market in sufficiently large numbers to meet demand. Let's look at stage three now. At the end of the stage two multiplication stage, there are many young plantlets, but they don't have roots yet. Let's assume the plants are Venus flytraps, and in that case, they might look something like this slide right here. So a lot of vegetative growth, but no roots in the agar medium. The next stage, stage three, involves rooting the young plants in vitro. The shoots or shoot clusters from stage two are prepared for transplanting by manually separating them and transplanting them to a rooting medium which contains a higher ratio of auxins to cytokinins. The containers are returned to the culture room until roots are formed and maybe the plantlets by that time will look something like the photo on the right here with lots of root growth and also lots of very healthy vegetative growth. Sometimes rooting the plants in vitro can be skipped, especially for plants that root really easily, such as Rex begonias. If the tissue culture lab sells stage three plantlets to wholesale nurseries, such as 
Pacific Plug and Liner in Watsonville, for example, that you saw in a, a video a couple of modules ago, then the unrooted plantlets will be sold in containers similar to the ones that you see on the right here. If the Tissue Culture Lab sells both stage three unrooted and stage four rooted plantlets, then the lab may transplant some of the plantlets directly into plug trays. If the lab only sells stage four plantlets, then they'll transplant all the easy to root species directly into plug trays. As you can imagine, substantial cost savings can be made if stage three can be skipped. Larger wholesale growers who have facilities where they can maintain young stage three plantlets under high levels of humidity and low light levels often choose to buy stage three plantlets as opposed to rooted stage four plantlets because they're much less expensive. It's really important though to have skilled workers who are able to work fast and accurately and to be able to manipulate the environment in order to make the cost savings worthwhile. The stage three plantlets are quite fragile and large losses can easily be suffered if the plantlets aren't handled correctly. Play this short 13 second video on the right to see workers at Little Prince of Oregon nursery transplanting either Hakoni grass or it might be Carex oshimensis, stage three plantlets. During stage four, the plantlets that were rooted in vitro during stage three are transplanted to plug trays and moved to the greenhouse. At the beginning of stage four, the plantlets have a very thin epidermis. The roots are often thin and fragile, and the plantlets are very vulnerable to any kind of environmental stress. The plantlets need to be acclimatized and hardened off really gradually in order to avoid large losses. Immediately after transplant, the plantlets should be given 100% relative humidity. Light levels should be gradually increased over a four week period, and both ambient and root zone temperatures should be maintained at levels that promote growth and reduce stress. This is usually a range between 65 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit, but it'll vary with species. The plantlets may need to be given bottom heat in order to maintain the root zone temperature at the desired level. At North American Plants in Oregon, plug trays of newly transplanted stage four plantlets are placed in mini hoop houses that have been constructed inside one of their greenhouses. In the photo, you can see newly transplanted plug trays of cherry rootstocks. Mist in each of the hoop houses is controlled individually, and you can also see yellow sticky paper being used to monitor for any pests. In this photo, you can see the mini hoop houses that I mentioned in the previous slide. At Pacific Plug and Liner in Watsonville, they place young tissue culture plantlets on benches in the greenhouse and have constructed hoops over the benches that are then covered with frost blanket, which is a very lightweight white woven material that allows light in, but helps to maintain humidity around the plants. Morphological changes take place during stage four as the plantlets are hardening off and acclimatizing to life outside the very comfortable, very controlled environment of the culture room. The plantlets develop a thickened epidermis, which helps to reduce water loss. They also develop thicker roots and they develop photosynthetic capacity. By the end of stage four, the young plant should be fully rooted into the plug trays, fully hardened off, and ready for sale as stage four plugs or liners. Or if the tissue culture lab is an in-house lab, the plantlets will be transplanted to larger containers.
We finished talking about the stages involved in tissue culture production. Let's look at a few other aspects of tissue culture now before finishing up this unit. Earlier, I mentioned that for some easy to root species and cultivars, it's possible to skip stage three, which is the in vitro rooting of plantlets. I also mentioned that there can be considerable cost savings by doing this. So let's look at that a little bit more. Rancho Tissue Technologies is a large tissue culture lab in Southern California. In fact, it's one of the largest in the country. And it started out specializing in succulents. It still produces many succulents, but also produces some herbaceous and woody material and has recently diver diversified its product line by adding hemp to its line of products. The purpose of this slide is to show you the price difference between stage three and stage four plantlets. Like all tissue culture labs that sell their plantlets to wholesale growers, Rancho Tissue publishes regular availability lists on its website, which are lists of all the species available for purchase. In Rancho's case, they also include some of the future availability, so growers can plan their production over the coming months and order ahead of time. Again, like most tissue culture labs, most of Rancho's business is actually contract grows. This means that wholesale nurseries, like Pacific Plug and Liner, for example, will place orders with Rancho perhaps one to two years ahead of time for specific quantities of specific plants in order to ensure they'll have that product when they need it. Plants shown on the general availability list that you can see on the right here may be surplus production from the contract grown material, but it'll also include material that was speculatively grown. The two sections of Rancho's availability list on the right are from their stage three and stage four availability as at the beginning of November 2020. If you look at the unit price of stage three plantlets of Agapanthus storm cloud, so here, you'll see that they cost 65 cents each, whereas stage four plantlets cost $1.35, so 107% more expensive. Note that this is per plant. It's not per plug tray or container. Stage four plants are sold in 72 or 98 cell trays, depending on the species. So a whole plug tray of Agapanthus storm cloud is going to set you back just over $97 plus shipping. Now look at the price difference between stage three and stage four for Agave Attenuata Bhutan Blue. Stage three plants are 85 cents each and stage four are 225 each. You can see that it would be really tempting for a grower to buy stage three plantlets in order to save a lot of money. Remember though that it's really easy to lose a lot of plants at this stage. So if you're going to buy stage three plantlets, it's absolutely crucial that you're able to provide appropriate environmental conditions for the plantlets while they're rooting and hardening off. In the long run, it may actually be more cost effective to be safe and buy the initially more expensive stage four plantlets. Let's look now at the advantages and disadvantages of tissue culture. One of the big advantages of tissue culture is that it's not weather dependent. Environmental conditions in the culture room are closely controlled, so plants can be grown year round and this enables the rapid exponential multiplication of explants, which I talked about earlier. Another advantage is that fewer stock plants are needed to produce new plants. This means that less land needs to be set aside for stock plants, which can be extremely useful in places like California, where land is expensive. Little maintenance is needed while the plantlets are in vitro in the culture room. The containers are completely self-contained and the plants being cultured have everything they need. No supplemental irrigation, pesticides or fertilizers are needed. So that's less work that's required 
compared to growing plants in a regular nursery. Plantlets produced in tissue culture can be exported across the world relatively readily because they should be free of known pests, diseases and viruses. They're small and therefore transportation costs are also relatively low. And there's no mineral soil attached to the roots. Most countries don't allow the importation of plant material which has mineral soil attached to it because of the risk of introducing soil-borne pathogens. Tissue culture also, of course, has its downsides. And the main downside is the cost. While it's possible to set up a small lab relatively inexpensively in your garage, a substantial capital investment is needed to establish a commercially viable, efficient lab. And this may be beyond the financial reach of many growers. The alternative is contracting with specialist labs to grow material for you. And this may well be the better alternative if you can't take advantage of the economies of scale that tissue culture can offer. A second disadvantage is that the sanitary environment is absolutely essential. There are usually hundreds of thousands, if not millions of plantlets in the culture room, and therefore the potential for very large financial losses as a result of contamination by pathogens is huge, not to mention the loss of your reputation. Thirdly, as with conventional propagation methods, there's no one size fits all protocol. There can often be a really long R&D, that's research and development phase, to develop protocols, and sometimes a protocol can't even be developed. Again, just like conventional propagation, sometimes a protocol that's been used successfully in the past may for some reason not work with a particular crop. And lastly, this isn't really a disadvantage, but just something to be aware of. A tissue culture lab needs to be designed really, really carefully. The layout and workflow should be logical and most importantly, reduce the risk of cross-contamination. Of course, this also applies to a regular nursery. Finally, Let's look at a few of the main applications of tissue culture. You heard earlier that young plants can be propagated at an exponential rate, much, much faster than conventional macro propagation techniques. And this is particularly useful for plant breeders when they're ready to introduce a new cultivar to the market and they want large numbers of plants available in a relatively short period of time. In many edible and ornamental crops, Tissue culture is used to eliminate viral diseases and produce clean plant material. Certified virus-free material is available for strawberries, potatoes, and roses, to mention just a few crops. And this is usually done using apical meristems. Viruses are usually transported within the plant through the vascular system. In meristematic regions, the cells are dividing rapidly and the vascular tissue usually hasn't developed there yet. Therefore, any viruses can't reach these areas and tissue from the meristems can be removed and used to propagate virus-free material. In Canvas, there's a short video for you to watch from UC Davis on the excision of strawberry meristems for tissue culture in order to produce virus-free material. Tissue culture can also be used in conservation to propagate endangered plant species. At Tree of Life Nursery in San Juan Capistrano, they're tissue culturing some of our native Dudleya species whose wild populations have been decimated by overseas poachers in recent years. And you may have read about that in the news. There's a picture here on the right of a couple of gentlemen who were caught red-handed with a van load of Dudleya which they'd collected from the cliffs along the California coast. And unfortunately, hardly any of these Dudleya can be returned to their native habitat. So what does the future of tissue culture look like 
Well, the use of tissue culture techniques has been growing rapidly over the last 20 years. Every year I hear about more and more nurseries who are setting up their own in-house labs and well-established independent labs like Rancho Tissue Technologies who are expanding their product lines to include more and more crops. There also seem to be a large number of labs being established in countries like India and China where labour costs are lower than they are here or in Northern Europe. So it's possible we may see this starting to drive down the unit cost of tissue cultured plants. Perhaps US and Northern Europe based companies will also be moving their high cost tissue culture operations offshore in order to do, take advantage of lower labour costs in these countries. As you probably realised earlier in the lecture, there's a lot of repetitive, highly detailed work in tissue culture. The skill and dexterity needed for this is usually recognised by this work being more highly paid than regular propagation work. And one of the major changes coming to tissue culture will probably be the introduction of robotics to automate some of the processes for crops where very large quantities are required on a regular basis, such as strawberries or blueberries. In the photo on the right here, you can see a relatively new piece of technology which was developed by Forbio. This piece of equipment is able to automatically pick up plantlets from the agar gel trays and then section them using machine vision. It's able to identify exactly the right cutting points and then it replants the sections in new trays. And this robot has enabled production rates to be increased by 500% and eliminated a lot of the more difficult, highly skilled and labor intensive operations. Most importantly for tissue culture, it's also reduced the level of contamination. So I think robotics, as with a lot, lot of other aspects in ag and hort, are going to play an increasingly important role in tissue culture in the coming decade. So, as usual, let's do a quick summary of what's been covered in this unit. Tissue culture is the propagation of small pieces of plant tissue in vitro in a sterile environment. And a variety of vegetative and reproductive plant tissues can be used. There are five main stages recognized in tissue culture, stage zero through stage four. And stage three can sometimes be omitted for plants that root easily. Tissue culture is a growing sector of the nursery industry. It enables plants to be produced year round and usually much more quickly than conventional techniques. Tissue cultured plants are expensive to produce though and this is reflected in the price of young plantlets. It's possible that this price may be reduced in the future for growers who have the capital to invest in robotics. Although an increasing range of plants are being propagated by tissue culture techniques, it's unlikely that they will ever fully replace conventional vegetative techniques in the foreseeable future. And therefore, it's still important for all of us to be familiar with all the techniques of plant propagation. Thanks for listening. Now head back to Canvas and take a look at the next unit in tissue culture before going over to do the quiz for this module.